the only exit from there you see in Jerusalem must go through the Jewish neighborhood of Givat Shaul. So the people of, of Der Yassin didn't have any choice but to have good relationship with their neighbors in Givat Shaul. We know now, we have a document that was uh, uh, um, um, uh, Dr. Ariela Zulai uh, wrote about it, uh, um, an agreement that was signed between the people of Der Yassin and the people in Givat Shaul in January 1948. They agreed that both sides will not attack each other and will not allow any other people to attack each other. Unfortunately, in April 9th, when the attack to Der Yassin started, some of the troops and the attackers came out from Givat Shaul the neighboring Jewish neighborhood. So who broke the agreement was the people of Givat Shaul. The, uh, um, the, the, the Palestinian families were expelled to the area of the West Bank and East Jerusalem. And those people were occupied again in 1967. Some of these families came immediately after 1947 to visit their own village and their original houses to see what happened. One of the guys that uh, we interviewed a few years ago, who Mahmoud, who is living in the old city of Jerusalem, came immediately uh, to one of his Jewish friends in Givat Shaul. His name is Yaakov. Yaakov the Iraqi Yaakov. The Iraqi Yaakov. That's uh, how Abu Mahmoud uh, named him. He visited him in his house and asked him to go to gather, to make round, go around the Der Yassin village. And then he was shocked to see that some of the houses were destroyed and here some of the painful uh, 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 stories from Yaakov himself. Yaakov, the Jewish guy, the friend of Abu Mahmoud, knew about murdering the prisoners. Even he showed the place where the bodies were taken. But Yaakov is just one of many Israelis that are living in denial with no, with no any acknowledgement of the massacre of Der Yassin or other massacres in other places in Palestine in 1948. 70 years after the expulsion and the massacre, we will not see any sign or any uh, 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 memorial site in the area of Der Yassin today. The Israelis will not allow to make any step that acknowledge the massacre and uh, what happened in Der Yassin. 72 years after the massacre, Israeli archives are playing a role to hide the facts and the truth. They are not releasing the documents of their Yassin till today. So we think that we know the story of their Yassin. We know many terrible uh, 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 actions that took place in their Yassin. So we, can, we will ask the question, what still the Israeli archives and the Israeli government want to hide from us and doesn't want us to know uh, about the events in Der Yassin? Two years ago, an Israeli film producer, Neta Shushani, uh, produced a film that called Born in Der Yassin, and she wanted to see some of the photos and the, the documentary of Der Yassin uh, uh, the archives refused. She sued the archives and the uh, the committee uh, in the Israeli High Court. And the Israeli High Court decided at the end of the discussion that uh, 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 this documentary will not be open, even not today. And the uh, uh, excuse was, if we will open that, this will affect make damage 
the relationship of Israel with other countries in the region and in the world, and it will, it will uh, affect the image of the state of Israel. So imagine that the, uh, uh, the story of Dar Yassin and many stories of the Palestinian Nakba, even we know a lot, we still don't know many things that are still hidden in the Israeli archives. The, uh, 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 the other aspect of the ongoing Nakba is preventing the return. Palestinian refugees in general, and of course the people of Dar Yassin, were not allowed since the expulsion that day on April 9th to come back to their places and their homes. Even after the State of Israel was established and even after the formal war ended. I think this, uh, uh, the whole story from the planning to capture and to expel Palestinian families to the preventing them to come back even today, and this is a final decision, we can say, for the Zionist perspective and the, 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 uh, the state of Israel are not allow people, uh, uh, Palestinian refugees to come back to their places. Um, okay, I will try for the last time just to show some of the photos and the maps and we will see the hacker, if he's still here or she's still here, what they can do. Okay, I'll go very fast with this. Uh, uh, this is the a map from 1870. The location of Dar Yassin is five kilometers west to Jerusalem over here. And this map in the early 40s, you can see Dar Yassin is still here, but other new names were added to the map, like Givat Shaul, that I mentioned, which is very, very close to the village of Dar Yassin uh, uh, over here, and other Jewish settlements and neighborhoods were built in the area like Beta Kerem and uh, Yefenov and other uh, uh, Hebrew names that you can see the map. But again, you can see the Yassin uh, uh, village and the Palestinian neighboring village, Kalunia and Ein Karem, and Lifta, and Malha, Al Jora, all of them were occupied and expelled in 1948, not only Dar Yassin. This fantastic map was done by the uh, refugees of Dar Yassin themselves. Uh, uh, they uh, actually located the, um, uh, they marked the houses, the locations of the houses, and they gave numbers to each building and each uh, uh, house. And on the side, they have a list with the names of the owners of every, uh, uh, every house. So in, uh, These examples of the old houses of Yassin in the center of the village, most of them today are still existing inside uh, the compound of the hospital uh, that I mentioned. Most of the people of Yassin used to work, unlike the other Palestinian villages that used to work in agriculture, most of the people of Yassin used to work in stone cutting. Uh, uh, they have their own fac factories and their own trucks and the village was rich, by the way. Most of the people were, were in very uh, good economical situation. This is the agreement that I mentioned between Giv'at Shaul and uh, Dar Yassin people. Even I can say that this is kind of surrounded agreement, not really uh, uh, equal sides that are, are deciding uh, things uh, on each other. It's one-sided. Uh, uh, asking, demanding the people of Dar Yassin uh, to give information 
the people of Givat Shaul, if they feel any dangers, will come out from the village of Der Yassin towards the Jewish neighborhoods or towards Givat Shaul. As I said, the people of Der Yassin didn't have much options uh, 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 in the situation on the in the location uh, uh, of their own village that was surrounded with uh, Jewish neighborhoods and Jewish settlements in 1948. Um, um, this is the map of the of the attacks. It is Givat Shaul. This is the uh, uh, center of the village of Der Yassin. What, Part of the attackers came from Givat Shaul, the others from Beit Kerem. The news about Der Yassin went very quick, quickly to, uh, uh, to the media. Even the New York Times, one day after, reported that more than 200 people were killed in Der Yassin. By the way, all the partners, Palestinians and the Arab governments and the uh, media and the Zionist militias exaggerated with the numbers of the murdered people in Der Yassin. In the beginning, we talked about 200, 250 people were killed in Der Yassin, but today we have a list that the people of Der Yassin uh, 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 made, and we have the names of 108 people that uh, uh, had been murdered and massacred that day. These are the houses of my Radwan family in Fani Sharim Street. You can see uh, this is a two stores a house, two floors house, and this is one floor house on the side of Fani Sharim Street, number 60. And here you can see the, uh, the, the stone with a few lines in Arabic was covered with this piece of uh, uh, iron on the front of the, uh, uh, of the house. This is the school that is used today as a, a synagogue, still there today. Uh, uh, this is a house, uh, again, part of house in Confena Sharim 37 belongs to the a family of Zainab Akil Ahran. This lady uh, took part in our uh, tours for uh, uh, three or four years. She passed away three years ago, unfortunately. And this is uh, the house that she was expelled from. The other side of the street, you will see over here, high building, white building that uh, had number of houses belonging to the families of Zahran, Radwan, Dati. This location faced one of the uh, uh, brutal attacks. Not less than 38 people were murdering in this place. All of them, members of civilians, of families, uh, old people, men, uh, uh, and children, and women. I, just want to have a few minutes of uh, respect to the victims of Der Yassin by reading some of the names of the people who had been murdered in this area. Uh, this is the list that the people of Der Yassin uh, prepared with the names of the, uh, of the people had been murdered, but I want just to invite one of our uh, colleagues in Zohrot Najwan to read uh, uh, names of part of this list. And please just uh, uh, listen to the names. Najwan, you can unmute yourself. One minute, please. <laughs> 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 
Okay, I'm sorry, I, I don't see that. I will read the names, uh, allow me. Uh, if we were not attacked. All these are names of the um, massacred people of Deryasin. I will just read a few of them. Fatma Eid, Al Haj Muhammad Zahran, Hamda Zahran, Fatmi Habsa, Ali Muhammad Zahran, Muhammad Ali Muhammad Zahran. Ahmed Musa Zahran, Zainab Muhammad Hussain Al Malihiya, Asmi Musa Zahran, Dawood Musa Zahran, Sa'id Musa Zahran, Fatmi Jum'a Zahran, Tafi Jum'a Zahran, Fathi Jum'a Zahran, Fathi Jum'a Zahran, Usra Jum'a Zahran, Maysar Jum'a Zahran. رقية حمدة زهران تميحة أحمد زهران نظمي أحمد زهران عزيزي أحمد زهران نظمي أحمد زهران محمد محمود زهران محمد عبد علي مصلح عزيزة مصلح وطفة مصلح علي مصلح حياة البلبيسي عبد الرؤوف الشريف حسين عبد الرؤوف الشريف if you notice that the uh, family name repeated many times, which means that most of the people were part of the same family and were murdered in their houses. Um, this is a letter that uh, uh, even Albert Einstein knew about the massacre of Der Yassin and he sent a letter in the day after the massacre on April 9th the uh, uh, American friends of fighters for freedom of Israel, and he uh, expressed his anger uh, regarding the news came from uh, Der Yassin. And he said, uh, um, is, uh, I'm not willing to see anybody associated with these criminal people. Uh, so the news about Der Yassin went very fast uh, all over the, uh, the world. This is the health, uh, the mental health center. Some of the houses are inside the, uh, the compound of the hospital are still there. And this is the location of the bakery, one of the famous locations that most of the testimonies that we had from Der Yassin mentioning uh, the, uh, this place. By the way, the last names that I mentioned in the list that I read uh, were the owners of the bakery father and a son that were murdered inside the bakery without any taking part in any part in the clashes or in the uh, uh, um, defending on the, uh, on the village. Uh, the, Jew the Jewish neighborhood that was built, Harnof, that was built in Der Yassin is uh, a ultra Jewish Orthodox neighborhood. And they had a very big yeshivas, uh, 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 religion centers. One of them is this one called the Khal HaTorah, the Torah Temple, and it's located very, very close to the cemetery of Der Yassin. The cemetery partly still there. Beyond this wall and these trees, you can see some of the tombs are still in the area of the cemetery, but most of the tombs are destroyed. And unfortunately, sometimes people entering the cemetery and vandalizing the tombs and doing whatever they do want to do there. These photos I took four years ago uh, from the cemetery. And if you read Hebrew, you can notice that are uh, written in the tombs over here, Mavit Larvim, Death to Arabs. Some of the people who were taken to the old city of the people were just going around the, uh, uh, the market in the old city without knowing where to go. These children 
are some of the orphan children of their Yasin. Their parents were murdered and killed in the village. And they didn't know where to go, just walked around the old city. A fan, uh, uh, amazing lady, her name is Hindel Husseini, came to the old city. She collected these small uh, uh, kids, these people, and took them a shelter that she built, started built in 1940. In, uh, 48, uh, 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 they lived in the in the shelter till the age of 18, and uh, the shelter became during the years school and a college, and still existing till today in East Jerusalem in Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood, and known as the College of Dar al Arabi, the house of the child of the Arab child. Again, just to remind us that we did the, uh, uh, the, the, the event, the memorial event in Deir Yassin in the location of the village. And this year, unfortunately, we're doing that uh, in this way, but I'm happy to do that uh, with, with you. Uh, the last thing that I just want to, to invite you uh, to experience, um, the, the Israeli policy is uh, doing all the time Rager of the Palestinian names and signs and uh, uh, identity from the landscape. The name of Deir Yassin, of course, was disappeared from the Israeli maps over here. By the way, this is the location of Deir Yassin, Harnov, over here in the left map. And not so far in a, 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 another hill, the uh, Holocaust Museum is located. You can observe there you seen from the Holocaust Museum and you can observe the, uh, uh, the, the area of the museum from there you seen. But you will not see, as I, I said before, any mention of there you seen in the, during the tours that people do in the Holocaust Museum. The name of there you seen is not existing anymore in the Israeli signs and maps, but we as Zohrot uh, uh, published uh, a Nakba map with the names of the whole Palestinian erased villages and towns, and also very fantastic uh, uh, app for smartphones called iNakba. Invite you to download the iNakba, and you search Deir Yassin, and the iNakba will take you to Deir Yassin. You can use it as a GPS. This will be the only GPS that takes you to this. It's not existing. Thank you for listening. Uh, I'm sorry if it was uh, uh, long. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm stopping over here and I want to invite uh, uh, some people to add more, uh, uh, more things. As I said, we, we have guests from uh, um, Canada, the United States, Europe, and uh, uh, South Africa. Uh, I will try to um, invite uh, I see screen, Miko Pellet, my friend Miko Pellet, please, I'm inviting you. I just want to, uh, excuse me, ask, want to ask you to introduce yourselves and say the things that you like to say. Please, you can unmute yourself, I uh, uh, think. If not, I will manage. Now you are. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Omar, for putting this together and for inviting uh, everybody to participate. This is, um, it's uh, heartbreaking, it's tragic, it's horrifying. Um, I took a tour in Deir Yassin with you about a year or two ago. And I grew up in Jerusalem and I had no idea. I, I had no idea. I mean, I walked by those houses. I drove by those houses. I had no idea of what I was uh, driving through, what I was seeing. And uh, so I want to thank you for pointing it out. I want to thank you and Zuchrot for the important work that you do in keeping the name Dirastin alive and keeping the memories of these people alive. 
Um, and it's immensely, immensely important, I think, the work that you do. And the Reset, of course, has become a symbol. It's like you said, it's not the only one. It wasn't the worst one. But probably because of its location and because of the circumstances particular to that, uh, to, to this village, it became probably the most well-known or one of the most well-known uh, uh, massacres conducted by the Zionists in Palestine. The people, you know, some of the children, some of the women and children that were displayed and then dumped in the old city and um, and taken, uh, which would, became an orphanage, I think, in the beginning, um, are still around somewhere and they're still alive and they probably have children. Um, and I think it's incredibly important that they know that there are people out here who, are, who remember this, who talk about this, who won't let the, the memories of their family in the village be forgotten. Um, and so again, I, I can't I can't overemphasize how crucial and how important this is to keep talking about it, to keep the name Dresin alive, to take the tours, to put the signs. I know you go throughout the country to put signs in different places. Dresin is probably the hardest one because it's really in the heart almost of Jerusalem, um, and it's probably the most um, of of all the massacres of all the events. It's the one that they choose to forget more than any because it's right there sitting there like like a sore um and you know i went on the uh website of the of the mental hospital and you can see the inside you can see the houses on the inside and it's really beautiful uh the houses it's it's really fantastic it's beautiful beautiful palestinian homes beautiful palestinian uh neighborhood and it still exists and it's uh, like you said the madness the absurdity the callousness of of uh of, of establishing a mental institute or, or a healthcare facility in that particular place. You know, in the movie uh, 1948, Creation and Catastrophe, they actually interview some, um, some of the um, survivors and particularly someone who saw what happened in the bakery. You mentioned the bakery and how they threw the father and son into the oven and so forth. A man who actually saw it and he's describing it and he's crying and he's in tears. Um, but you know, at the same time, I think the UFC never stopped, never ended. Um, it wasn't the first, it wasn't the last, but because of its name, it's like every time there's another massacre, it's going back, it's the UFC happening again. So whether it was later on in Kufar Qasim or in Kibia or in Gaza or in Lebanon, Sabra and Jatila, Jenin, it goes on and on. Um, Gaza over and over again. Every time there's a massacre, it's Dir Yassin is being killed again. It's like the people of Dir Yassin are being destroyed again. They're being killed again because many of these massacres, the later massacres, uh, are take take place and uh, in refugee camps. And so these are refugees who have already run away, who have already escaped and managed to survive somehow the ethnic cleansing and the genocide. And now again, they are being killed again and again and again. And it's like Israel. <laughs> This, this horrifying you know, entity, this criminal entity, wants to kill and kill and kill and kill until the memory completely dies away. And of course, the memory is not going to die away because Palestinians won't forget. And thanks to you, Omar, and the work that Zohrot does, and the rest of us here, I hope, we won't let it end and we won't let it happen. And um, you know, it's very difficult to talk about this and not uh, use terms like genocide and not use terms like ethnic cleansing, which you've used, which I, which I agree with, and uh, not recognize that what Israel has established in Palestine what has been happening in Palestine for more than 70 years is the line is weak the definition of the crime fits and so it's important that we that we that we use these terms it's important that we talk about them and we say this and i'll just end by saying maybe two things you know i wear this button always when i'm in public when i when i'm at events i asked you for permission to make sure it was okay with you um i think it's incredibly important that we act in other words what is happening in palestine today is a continuation of the Yassin. it never stopped the massacre the killing the the horrors never, never stopped, as, as you know. And so 
by standing with the Palestinian call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, by by supporting the Palestinian call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel, we stand with these people. This is what we have. This is the way that we protest. This is the way that we show our, our we participate in the resistance against these horrors, against these crimes that are continuously and constantly being committed against the Palestinian people. And a last note that I'll say, one last thing, you know, I think you, you, the campaign that Zuhrot has about the return, imagining the return, I think it's a wonderful initiative and I think it's an initiative that everybody needs to join and, and promote because the return is really the key to, to, to bringing back justice to Palestine. Without the return, there will be no, uh, there will never be justice. Certainly there will never be peace between the people in Palestine, Israelis and Palestinians. So I want to encourage everyone to look into the campaign that you have and to, and, and, to, and to support it and to talk about the return, not like it's some you know, crazy idea, but like it's a very practical and real and necessary uh, action. So once again, um, thank you very, very much for, for this whole Thank, you, Nico, thank very you very much. much. You are talking with us from uh, uh, Washington, right? Yes, Washington, D.C., yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, we are also honored to have with us, say, Abby Martin. Is she here? I don't see her in my screen. I don't see her either. Don't. Okay, so now uh, we will go to South Africa, to Cape Town, A.D. Greenbaum. A.D.? Oh, just a minute, I will. Guys, you can unmute yourselves, but Muted. Yeah, now I we hear you. Hi. Okay. Hi, hi everyone. Um, thank you, Omar. Um, thank you, everyone. Hello, friends, comrades across the four wings. Um, <clears throat> um, Omar, I, I actually wrote something quite short because. I, I didn't want to waste anyone's time with um, trying to pluck words out of the air. Um, and I also wanted to take very seriously your, your challenge to us, um, in a way, in the invitation, to think about what it means to commemorate uh, the massacre at Deir Yassin and to think about the Nakba and about return and freedom um, in this, this current moment. So I was wondering what it means to, to, to reflect and to commemorate together and apart in this way, um, especially where I'm sitting on the other side of the Great Sahara um, during these days of planetary pa pandemic and lockdown and emergency. And what does it mean to remember with you uh, the massacre, depopulation, destruction of Deir Yassin, which as you and Miko and uh, Serene and others have shared, um, is an event that was so central to the Zionist regime's drive to dispossess Palestinians of land and of political and existential collectivity. And as Miko said, uh, an event so symbolic of the ongoing Nakba. But also what does it mean to remember with you from this place, this South Africa, with its symbolic force, both in the wake of the defeat of apartheid by a black led broad coalition of political liberation movements and of civic formations. And then the constraints and failures and disappointments of these struggles um, and promises of freedom. So for example, during lockdown now, uh, the, the, the lockdown in South Africa is very intense. We cannot walk out in the street. Um, we, we can't leave our homes, much, much less our often small and inadequate shelters. But 
under these conditions, about 25 million people have no or very precarious access to food security, to clean water or um, adequate shelter, so let alone a house. So I just want to briefly think these three things together. But when I think about Dir Yassin, my first thoughts aren't thoughts, uh, certainly not with words, um, they're feelings. And I feel the weight of the wreckage of lives, of loves, of dreams, of hopes, of art, of ideas, of commerce, of bread baking, of teachers teaching. The destruction of a place that all the people of Dir Yassin called their home in the world that was destroyed that day, which is to say on this day in 1948. I, I feel also the weight of the layers of denial and erasure, the force of historical revision that continuously attempt to bury the fullness uh, and historicity of life in Palestine, of Palestinian life. And these forces are particular to the Israeli regime and practiced with a particular and cold-hearted cruelty, but they're also particular to other settler col colonial regimes and paradigms, such as South Africa, Australia, the United States, and Algeria. And I have to say increasingly, it seems as if Israel is moving closer to the United States paradigm, even away from South Africa's. These, these forces are important because they also features of the current world system, which has condemned us all to live in a perpetual present, devoid of history, emaciated of other memories of the future, of other memories for other futures and other politics. But the condemnation of these forces of de for denial affect those who are powerful, empowered, and or dispossessed in very different ways, as the descendants from Dir Yassin and all of the Nakba villages from 1948 until today know across generations and in places near and far. In the system of knowledge that has shaped these forces of denial, race, gender, sexuality, class, citizenship, nationality, species even, all forms of life are taken to be separate and they organized in a kind of hierarchical scale of difference. So the system of denial incessantly wipes away the traces of memories of other possibilities of living in interconnected ways other possibilities such as the ones that are so, so tenaciously pursued and at a very high price, nonetheless, by Zohrot, by many people here, um, and by activists, intellectuals, and artists across Palestine, Israel, and its diasporas. These are non-partitioned pa paradigms, and they draw on histories of joint struggles sometimes shared and sometimes not shared histories of struggle too. And so for me to reflect in this time with you, and it's a great and very humbling honor and I'm very moved um, and trying to hold my emotion together. Um, in this time of planetary pandemic and emergency from South Africa to Palestine, Israel and beyond, is to glimpse a longer history and present of colonial catastrophe, pillage and destruction, but also a longer history of hope and resistance. It's to give, it, it gives a glimpse of the possibilities of a much longer arc of many people's struggles across the world that have come before. For now, the pandemic has disrupted the incessant work of that paradigm of denial and of hierarchy and separation. It's opening up a window of opportunity for us to commit across the world, 
across divisions that we take as normal to a vision and practice for a different future of life. And I think many people in South Africa share with me this idea that in so many ways, the Palis a Palestinian-led joint struggle for freedom, for freedom for all, for conditions of life that support all life, for a political future based on a different practice of politics is the way towards a future, not only in and for Israel, Palestine, Palestine, Israel, but for us all and for the planet. So Umar and comrades and friends, I send you my love and solidarity and struggle and my recommitment. Thank you for having me and sharing with me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, we, um, I'm honored to invite uh, Mr. Chris Williamson from London. I will unmute. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we do. Oh, thank you. Thank Thank you very much indeed. It's, a, it's an incredible honour to be invited to say a few words today and uh, I just want to really articulate and express the, the same view really that Heidi just did about how incredibly moving it was to listen to the horrific story about what happened at uh, De Deir Yassin and I think it's so important that we never forget what happened there and all the other atrocities that have been perpetrated against the Palestinian people and I think events like this are key in helping to spread the word. And one of the things that I will certainly do, having uh, heard your presentation today, is uh, use my platform, such as the ARC, on um, social media and, and, and other methods of getting the message out to spread the word about what's, what's happened. And so I want to express my solidarity with you, with the Palestinian people, and I think it's also important that we acknowledge that certainly in the United Kingdom that um, anti-Semitism has been weaponized by the Zionists to try and silence voices of solidarity with the Palestinian people. And it's had some impact, I've got to say, inside the Labour Party, my former political party. I was a member of the Labour Party and partly because of my solidarity with the Palestinian people, I was targeted. But I don't regret that because it's always important as... Now, as um, Martin Luther King once said, it's always the right time to do the right thing. And I always believe that it's key that we show solidarity when it's difficult, not just when it's easy. And it's disappointing that the new leader of the Labour Party, Keir Starmer, has, has really backed the wrong side. Uh, he seems to have come down on the side of the Zionists. But it's very clear from your presentation today that Zionism is a brutal racist ideology and we therefore, all right-thinking people around the world, need to call it out for what it is. And particularly people like myself who are socialists, it's absolutely essential, it seems to me, that we always identify with people who are being oppressed. And it's very clear that the Palestinian people have been oppressed now for 70 odd years and uh, we mustn't rest, we mustn't give up that fight to ensure that there is liberation for the Palestinian people. And although the leader of the Labour Party in Britain might have backed the wrong side, the truth of the matter is that the Labour movement in Britain is overwhelmingly on the side of the Palestinian people. And support is growing for a one-state solution. That seems to me to be the only way forward, really, where there are equal rights for Palestinians. I know there's been talk of a two-state solution. I think that's frankly absurd now, it's impossible for that really to uh, uh, ever get off the ground successfully. And I know that's the Labour Party policy to support the two-state solution, but I've got to say that support inside and outside the Labour Party is growing for a one-state solution. And so I just really want to conclude uh, with a quotation from Nelson Mandela because it's uh, important, all the privations that he experienced and and his experience of, of leading the, the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. And he said that we know too well that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. And that's something that we need to take to our heart, redouble our efforts. And I give you my commitment, as I've already said, that I will do 
everything within my power to make the case for the Palestinian people and build the support for the BDS movement, because I think that is a non-violent way of bringing pressure on the uh, Israeli regime to actually stop this oppression that they've been disgracefully responsible for for so many years. So thank you again for inviting me here today and all my solidarity with you and more power to your struggle. And in the end, with solidarity, with unity, I'm sure that we will see the liberation of the Palestinian people. Thank you very much, sir. Strong words, thank you very much. Uh, we'll fly to Ottawa. Um, our friend, Peter Larson, do you hear us? Can you hear you? Can you hear me? Yes, we do. Thank you very much, Umar. Umar, just before I start, I have a question for you. Uh, are you on purpose sharing your screen? Because the, what that does is it makes all your terrific speakers we can just see as very small thumbnails. Um, if you're doing it on purpose, that's that's fine, and that's your your call. You'll, no, you'll I, see again. What what do you see now? What do you well, see? I'm seeing those screen? three. I'm seeing those three maps. I'm hardly seeing your speakers. Oh, that. Uh, I assume that's the same for everybody else. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I'll. You can, I will go ahead. That's just a, 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 yes, an observation. Um, so I'm, I'm speaking here from Ottawa, Canada, where you all be happy to know it's snowing today. Um, we are a long ways away from Israel or Washington or uh, South Africa. It's springtime here, but believe it or not, it's snowing. And while you <coughs> see, you might, you might see a Swedish flag in, behind me on the wall, that is from my heritage and not from my nationality or citizenship because I am the chair of a tiny Ottawa organization called the Ottawa Forum on Israel-Palestine. And we were thrilled several years ago to have Miko Pellet come and speak to a meeting that we organized here. Canada is very different from Israel, of course. We're a very big country. Um, we're very far away, but we share a number of characteristics. One is that we're a developed, industrialized capitalist country, democracy. But another is that like Israel, we are a settler colonial country. That is to say that Canada was founded, today's Canada was founded 150 years ago by European settlers who came here on the strength of the British army and took over the land, expelling the native people. Nothing quite as dramatic as uh, Dir Yassin or as the the um, uh, huge expulsion that took place in short or, or order, but little by little, we've taken over this, this country. And that's a history that's been long denied in Canada. In, about 100, uh, in 19, 2017, we had our 150th anniversary, and we started off to celebrate uh, the founding of Canada. And our narrative, our, our, the narrative that I, I learned in school, was that Canada was founded by two founding peoples, the English and the French. And lo and behold, little by little, we are now starting to realize that that's not the truth, or that's only part of the truth. That we have a settler colonial past. There were people here before we, we, we arrived. And we have begun a process in Canada called the process of truth and reconciliation. To recognize what happened and to try to figure out how we're going to reconcile. And it's, it seems to me, in my view, this is a process that is uh, embraced by some. It's been embraced by some of the churches. Some of the schools are starting to change their textbooks to recognize that there were Indigenous Canadians here to recognize Indigenous culture. But there are also today many Canadians who resist it. This is an ongoing struggle, and I expect it's going to uh, continue to be a struggle for a while. But the, the idea of re reconciliation between Canada and its Indigenous people has to be on the firm uh, basis of uh, recognition of the truth. And I think that this is a process that inevitably um, Israel is going to have to go through with the Palestinians and the, and the work that, Deri, that um, Zohot is doing in terms of recognizing the truth, bringing its understanding to not only uh, Israeli Jewish um, populations, but to Palestinians and to people abroad, I think is very important. So my congratulations go to uh, Umar, and my congratulations go to Zohot, 
Uh, we are in the midst of a uh, ongoing struggle here in Canada, and we think it's very similar and um, uh, to the one that you are starting to initiate, and you will have an equally long struggle doing it. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak with alongside of these very fine other speakers, Omar. Thank you, Peter. We hope to see you again very soon, another delegation going to learn about the Nakba and the uh, situation in Palestine. Uh, I want to invite uh, Jonathan Shapira. Mm, he's in Oslo now. Uh, don't see you on the screen, but I know that you are there. Jonathan? Is Jonathan there? Oh yeah, now I see you. Yes, I'm, I'm muting you. Oh, can you hear me now? I hear you, yes. Okay. Hi. Hi. Okay, uh, thank you Omar for inviting me and uh, for the presentation uh, and to Nico and Heidi and Chris and Peter and uh, everyone that uh, that is here. Um, we talked, um, a couple of weeks ago, Omar, and, um, and I, I think I told you that let's take advantage of the corona epidemic uh, and, and make this event uh, international on Zoom. So I, I'm really happy that uh, it worked out. And I think we have uh, several dozens of people all over the world, and that's uh, warming my heart. And uh, I'm sending you all my support and solidarity and love from, uh, from Oslo. Um, I was supposed to uh, um, leave to uh, Gaza on uh, on board uh, a boat that was supposed to leave uh, in a few weeks from now and try to uh, again block the break the blockade um, and arrive uh, on the 31st of uh, May, which is the day when uh, the massacre on the Mavi Marmara happened exactly 10 years ago. Uh, obviously, because of the corona, the, the sale uh, is delayed. Um, but it just reminded me that uh, when it's almost two years ago in my last sale to, to Gaza, after we were arrested on, on board the Al Auda, the return boat, um, in the middle of the night in the investigation where uh, the Shabak or Secret Service uh, guy at the police station in uh, Ashdod uh, told me that I'm accused of uh, aiding the enemy, um, trying to bring uh, uh, symbolic uh, support and, uh, and uh, humanitarian aid to, to people and children in Gaza. I told him and uh, I tell you and I tell myself that uh, Gaza is uh, two million people, about one million of them are children, and um, if uh, if that's that what they accuse me of trying to help uh, two million people and one million children there, I'm I'm really proud to try to help this enemy, uh, and I think that all of us should uh, engage in aiding this enemy of us, two million people locked in the biggest ghetto in the world, uh, without even ability now to get the proper um, the proper things they need in order to cope with the, with the pandemic. Um, I just wanted to, I, I support every word that everyone here said, and I just wanted to maybe sing you a little song, if you don't mind. I hope the Zoom will, um, will uh, take the, the voice in the okay way. I'll sing you a song that, um, was written in the Vilna ghetto uh, during the Holocaust. Uh, it was written by Avraham Sotskover. It's a Jewish uh, poet. Uh, and the music was written by Avraham Sotskover, um, another uh, Jewish-Italian uh, young boy in the, in the Vilna ghetto. Um, and I learned this um, song by uh, my parents, my grandparents, and I uh, used to even sing it in all these uh, Zionist um, 
Holocaust uh, memorial service as a child. Um, he talks about um, the person that uh, is locked in the ghetto. His body is locked there, but his soul is floating above the walls and the houses and the buildings and in the alleys, uh, searching for some comfort, some, some kind of uh, relief and support. Um, every word that uh, he expressed is a tear and um, it's kind of a, a search for comfort, a search for solidarity um, uh, in, in the hardest uh, time. Uh, while I was uh, sailing to Gaza, I thought that it's maybe a good time to translate this mm -hmm. uh, beautiful um, Yiddish song to Arabic. Um, and to sing it uh, in solidarity with all the people in uh, in the Gaza ghetto in and in other ghettos that uh, are striving for freedom and for liberation. So I'll sing you the short song. It's uh, uh, starting in English and then in Arabic. And I hope you can hear uh, the words. Unter deiner weiße Stere streckt zu mir dein weiße Hand. Meine Wörter seinen Träre vielen Ruhen in dein Hand. Sehst du Gott, wer finden in mein kerberdigen Blick? Und ich hoffe, und ich dein Himmel zu schenken dir zu reden. Und ich hoffe, gar nicht kein Winkel, sei zu schenken dir zu reden. Ach, dann ist schon mal hell bei da, Mutter, Liebe, ja, da, ja. Alle Mati hier hat Mori, mit Leid, Salaha. Unduri la huyuni, Hamada bari kuba, ay sali shua unuri, ach meru kuba ililha, ay sali shua unuri, ach meru kuba ililha. Thank you very much. Wow. <clears throat> Thank you, Nathan. <clears throat> um, sorry. Uh, okay, I just want to check again if Abby uh, Martin with us. If not, I uh, just want to give opportunity to anyone who want to say something because we are uh, moving now to the uh, last speaker will be Rachel, uh, uh, our Zohro director, uh, to close the, the event. But before that, if anyone of you like to say a few words, this is the time. You can raise your hand if you want. So, Rachel, sorry, did Robert wanted to say something? Robert, do you hear me? Yes, I, I can see it now. I just want to say a couple of things about life in general. I'm in California. And the people here are incredibly uh, ignorant about uh, the Israeli conflict with the Palestinians. And uh, they must have just an incredibly uh, deep work ethic to save and acquire possessions 
and they're only disillusioned by that when they get old and die or have a serious injury. And I ask people up front uh, some simple questions to try to bring them to my awareness and about how and why the Israeli, the Jews, speaking of, uh, incited uh, the Nazis to genocide to begin with, which is what started the conflict that we're in. And I, I guess it's the Protocols of Zion that were introduced by Hitler that stirred everybody in Europe up, which, which brought the Nazis into control. Uh, Sir, uh, I just want to ask, because the line is not clear, just want to ask you if you can make that short. We can't hear you well. Um, I just want to bring out, uh, there's people around me who are incredibly ignorant about the conflict. Uh, the popular conception here is that the Jews are the chosen people, but if you talk to somebody of Jewish descent, they, they admit that they don't know what they're chosen for. And so it's my temptation just to erase that whole concept. Okay. Uh, there, there's another, there's something else that come to my attention. That is, uh, it seems like uh, George Bush, our ex-president, must have uh, condemned the idea of to, to not fraternize with other species. Okay, we, I suggest not to go there. We don't uh, want to deal with these uh, uh, issues, but thank you for now. Um, really, the line is not clear, so uh, um, to save time also, we want to finish uh, the event with the Rachel. So please, Rachel. Thank you, sir. A minute. Hi, thank you, Omar, for this um, incredible tour, as always. And it's great to know that uh, we can still learn, even if we can't physically be in various in this year. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all of the speakers. Uh, you were uh, very profoundly moving, all of you, and. Um, your ongoing support of uh, all of you who participated from all over the world uh, gives us uh, strength and courage every day uh, to do our work. Um, and I would like uh, to read a short paragraph uh, from the Zahot's uh, return vision uh, that is a conclusion of a work of a group of uh, Israeli um, activists who thought out uh, a political plan for return and uh, this is what we're here for not just to remember but to uh, strive towards um, a real peaceful just solution uh, with the return of the refugees in its core uh, so this is just a paragraph you can read the whole thing uh, on our website and uh, thank you all so much. Um, here it is. We see a future in which the land will be transformed following the refugees' return, transformed for the better. We envision a change that will allow a democratic society grounded in equity and freedom, a multicultural society that will express and acknowledge our Middle Eastern cultural origins and enable us to integrate in the region. This integration will also include the Jewish identity when it is no longer Zionist and racist. As a member of the Return Council, I do not want to see myself as an occupier, not to be one. We want to live in this land as equals. We therefore undertake to do our utmost to reach out to our public, our communities, to call for acknowledgement of the Nakba of our responsibility to the uprooting of most of the Palestinian people from their homeland, to recognize the right of return, redress the injustice, and to do justice for the sake of the life in, of peace and true partnership 
for all the inhabitants of this land. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Rochelle. Uh, yeah, uh, again, I want to thank you, all of you, for taking part in this event. Uh, just to finish with a few comments. The first, that I'm afraid that this is the only event that took place in the whole world mentioning and remembering the Yassin massacre. This is very, very sad for me. The other side, I'm so proud that we managed to do this event with you, with all of you, that we'll find a way to tell the descendants of Dar Yassin that we uh, uh, had about 90 minutes with wonderful people from all over the world remembering their massacre, their victims, and uh, hoping and acting for their freedom and return. So thank you all in good health and good night. A good day for some of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Bye-bye. as -salam. <laughs> of course it is. Uh, yeah, we can fix. We can fix any of that. Uh, just she should just just yeah. I'll just she'll. I'm sure she'll let she'll let me know when when she's ready to move on that. Uh, what? Wow. Yeah, that stuff's so confusing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> All right. Yeah.